We need more honesty in our dealings with one another. Well, that's the truth Dr. J. Vernon McGee shares today as we continue our study on the life of Nehemiah. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus for another great adventure in God's Word. Now, while you find your seat and you get comfortable, say a friendly hello to Through the Bible's President Greg Harris. He's here with an update on one of the great ways that we're getting God's Word out to Arabic speakers around the world. Yeah, well, I heard all those hellos and hello back to you. Uh, (laughs) When I used to live in the southern part of the United States, you'd say, hey, how you doing? Uh, It's so good to be together and reflect on what God is doing. We want to focus today on our Arabic TV ministry, but let's not forget most all of our TV programs, including those now in India that we've talked about, we're also still getting the audio out through yeah. digital and various apps and things like that. So when we talk about TV, we didn't replace it. We yeah. added it. So that's yeah. important. But Steve, these letters are so significant. I'd like us just to jump right in and let us all hear them. Yeah, this first listener calls himself John, and he's originally from Yemen and now lives in Saudi Arabia. Well, talk about jumping yes. from the frying pan yes. into the fire uh-huh. on those two places. Not easy to be a Christian or even listen to programs like Through the Bible. Here he goes. Thank you for the lengthy conversation answering my questions through WhatsApp. I am 33 years old and met the Lord in Yemen. He's got the date. I love this. 9-21-2016. At the end of 2017, I moved to Saudi Arabia. I work hard, try to live a quiet life, and love the Lord. I'm grateful for your programs that feed my soul. (laughs) Steve, I often see these what look like short letters and think there's a book in that letter uh like you said just to go from yemen not an easy place to saudi arabia where you literally uh can get in huge trouble just for having a bible uh or uh, saying you're a christian and note this our team has a lengthy conversation with him on WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Yeah, that's right. We love WhatsApp and it just shows remember when we talk about what we do it isn't just always flinging the seed out there. We have people all around the world that are cultivating the yeah. plants and, and helping, and particularly in the Muslim world, answering questions is huge. Yep. So I just talked a lot, so I'm going to let you read the next letter. Got it. Saida in Egypt. Thanks to the Lord for your great efforts. I was Muslim, but now I became a true Christian saved by grace of the Lord. I am Iranian, but I understand Arabic well. I am hungry to understand the Word of God through your program. In fact, your program presents the bread of my spirit. Please pray for me and my family. Once again, a simple line. I was a Muslim, but now I became a true Christian. I mean, that is a a, a truly supernatural event that took place. And she's Iranian, which means she would normally speak Persian or Farsi, Farsi. uh, but she understands Arabic. And, And again, this is why we try to spread the broadcasts and the digital as widely as we can, because you just don't know when that seed is going to take root. Now, this last one is a man that we've talked about before. We've written articles about him. His name is Hani, and he is in Yemen. Now, because of the sensitivity, Greg, we're not going to mention the countries uh, that this is occurring in, but this is an incredible story. Here's what this man writes to us. He says, I am grateful to the Lord for my faith. Your programs help me become mature in my knowledge. Please pray my family comes to know the joy found in a life believing and serving him. I often share your program with my family in here, and then he names a couple of very difficult countries. Yes, yes. And while I was in prison in one of those countries, I was blessed to see many people come to the Lord. This is the exciting yeah. part. They're new believers, but still in prison. I share your teaching with them as well. Please pray with me that their faith grows in this unfertile environment. Yeah, and, uh, and Steve, if, if we were able to give the specifics, and we're not doing it because we know this particular man, he needs to be protected, and so we want to make sure that uh, we don't do anything to uh, endanger him. But I love how he, he points out, we talk about flinging the seed and, re- and reaching the fertile soil. He is, he is fertile soil, but he understands that it's an unfertile environment. Yeah. So pretty powerful stuff. Yep. Greg, pray for us as we begin our study. Father, uh, we feel like falling on our faces when we see what you're doing in the lives of these Arabic TV viewers, how you're bringing transformation uh, in some of the hardest places, the most unfertile soil in the world. But your power is greater than anything that man can set up. And so we praise you and thank you. We pray you'd continue to use your word to break through and transform lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Here now is Dr. J. Vernon McGee with our study in Nehemiah 6 on Through the Bible. Now today, friends, we return back to the sixth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. We weren't in the sixth chapter, however, but we did finish the fifth chapter last time. Now this man, Nehemiah, has encountered about every form of opposition that is imaginable in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Satan has thrown in his pathway everything that is in his bag of tricks to cause this man to stumble and to fall and to fail in this endeavor. And he does the same thing with us today. Only many times in our experience why he succeeds and we do fail. God doesn't want us to, and he's made every arrangement that we should not fail. But we do, but Nehemiah did not. And we now come to this sixth chapter. The wall is about finished. And we saw last time that the thing that hurt Nehemiah more than anything else was the fact that he was not accepting a salary. He was very unselfish. And he was making a great sacrifice to rebuild the wall. And then he found out that some of his brethren, especially among the nobles, they were in the real estate business, and they were in the loan business, and that they were making money out of the hardship of other folk and out of their difficulties. And as a result, this is the thing that made Nehemiah angry. But he got that straightened out, and he had to do it in a forthright manner. And you can't pussyfoot around when you're dealing with those on the inside that are not being exactly honest and truthful. There are those today that are in our churches, friends, and we need to recognize that. When you hear somebody mouth a few pious platitudes and some very spiritual verbiage, it doesn't mean they're spiritual. It could be just a cover-up. You find out whether they've got their hand in the till, whether they are making money out of it, whether they are in on this. It's quite amusing and amazing to me that in some places you find some of the brethren, they sell all the real estate to the church that it buys. They handle all the business, but they do it at a profit and at a very nice profit. They sell the insurance and all that. And you generally find that they're not very good and they're giving, by the way. They are more interested in the dollar than they are in God's work. And that is the thing that actually hurts the Lord's cause today. Now, he got that straightened out. That doesn't mean that he's solved all the problems and that everything will be a bed of roses from here on, for it wasn't. Now, will you notice verse 1? Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein. Notice now the honesty of this man. This man is like Nathaniel. There's no guile in him whatsoever. That is, he's not being subtle or clever. So many people today, again, like to use that method in church work, being very subtle. They don't tell you everything they should tell you, you know, about a certain matter. And I've already mentioned this. Reports are not full and complete. They're slanted. They're built up, filled in, and the truth is not told. How many times that happens today? Always appreciated, and I love my cancer doctor. He's a Christian. The very first thing he told me was this. When he suspected I had cancer, he said, Dr. McGee, I'm going to tell you the truth because if I don't, you wouldn't have confidence in me. And from that day to this, he has laid it on the line. When there wasn't any hope for me, at least it didn't look like it, he very frankly put it down there. He didn't attempt to paint a rosy picture. He didn't attempt to cover up. He told me like it was. And I've always appreciated that. I think that that is something that is needed today 
in business, it's needed in social gatherings, and it's needed, I think, in the church. Of all places, it's certainly needed there. Now, I don't mean that that should cause us to be blunt and actually crude. If you're introduced to a lady and you don't have to tell her that she's beautiful if she's not beautiful. After all, I'm of the opinion you can't kid her anyway. She knows. You don't need to tell her that, but you could tell her that she makes good biscuits. That is, if she does make good biscuits. But we need today more honesty in our dealings one with another. And I love this man, Nehemiah, here. Now, Sanballat, and Geshep and Tobiah, their enemies, and these three little playfellas, I want to tell you, they've caused a lot of trouble. They've heard that he had finished the walls. Now notice what he says. Though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates. He said, to tell the truth, they got the impression we were through. We weren't through. <laughs> they got the wrong report. It was exaggerated a little. And the honesty of Nehemiah is a tremendous thing. He's clairvoyant. You just see right through him. He's as clear as the noonday sun. He tells you like it is. Now notice that Sanballat and Geshep said unto me. Now they saw that their opposition had not failed. It's the same old story. When you can't fight City Hall, you join it. And so they said now, they said, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. Now, the place where they were going to meet is interesting. It was the plain of Ono, O in O. And you know what Nehemiah said? He said, oh no. <laughs> he said, you want to meet in Ono? All right. Oh no, I'm not coming. And they thought to do him mischief. And so they idea was, they said, now let's meet together and talk our differences over and see if we can't work this out. Now, their thought was that they were going to do him harm. They probably had attempt to slay him. So what did he do? Well, verse 3, I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work. So, <laughs> no use going into detail with that crowd. So, that I cannot come down. I don't need to tell you exactly what I'm doing, so I can't come down. I'm doing a good work. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? And I love this man, Nehemiah, and I think that you've discovered that this man has such wonderful characteristics. He'd been successful, and therefore Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshep, they wanted to compromise. Now, he very frankly tells us he hadn't completed the wall. Now, the thing they wanted to do, they wanted him to come to neutral ground to harm Nehemiah. Now, there are those today that want the church to compromise. They feel that you are very bigoted, you are very dogmatic, and if you don't meet with these folk, very candidly, a long time ago, I quit meeting with folk like that. I used to meet with them, but today I only meet with those that will meet with me around the person of Christ. And you know, it's been wonderful. And I've met with some unusual groups, by the way. I have held meetings now, and well, you'd just be amazed at some of the churches that we've been in today. And I'm in total disagreement with the organization and with some of the doctrines. But I find that some of these people are real believers. And I'll meet with anybody around the person of Christ. They'll meet like that. But I'm not prepared to meet with the enemy today at all. And I'll be very frank. I think William Jennings Bryan made a big mistake in meeting in Cleveland, Tennessee with Dara and debating this subject of evolution. Now, I think William Jennings Bryan walked all over Dara. I think that any honest person reading the debate has to come to the conclusion that William Jennings Bryan was on the winning side. But I think that the very fact he met with this man, that it was really a losing battle. And it's certainly been demonstrated since then that it was. And I don't think that you are going to 
be able to win an enemy by meeting with him like this. Now, that's my conviction on this. But I don't care what group he belongs to. As I said a moment ago, I've been in several churches that I'm sure that you'd be surprised that I'd go in. Well, I'll mention the group, Pentecostal. I've been now in several Pentecostal churches. Somebody says to me, why? Dr. McGee, you have been severe in your attack upon them. You've been very unlovely in the things you've said about them. That's right. But you know, I found out they believe in the person of Christ. They believe in his deity. They believe he died for their sin. Now, someday when we meet in the presence of Christ, and they're going to be there too, by the way, but they're going to agree with me in that day. And we're going to be in perfect agreement. Of course, they're going to have to be changed. And you know something? I'm going to have to be also. So I expect all of us will be making some changes relative to minor considerations. But we just can't meet with the enemy. That's the reason today I'm not joining organizations. I don't belong to any organization anymore. I'm an ordained minister. But I just don't meet with any organization at all. And as a result... I just go to all of them if they believe the Word of God and if they believe in the deity of Christ, believe he died for our sins. I just meet with those people, and I don't care what label they got on. It doesn't make any difference to me. And some of them have got some funny labels on them. But they believe, as I do about these things, I just have to meet with them. Now, let's move on here. The thing that Nehemiah said, he said, I'm doing a good work, and I don't have time to come down and waste my time with you. And God's people do not need to compromise today. This man takes an uncompromising attitude. Now we are told, verse 4, Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. They're persistent. This crowd's always persistent. And notice what happened then. If you want to know whether they really wanted to be friendly and compromise or not, notice this. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. Now, it's couched in polite language, but you know it's a hook with bait on it, and it's a mean letter, and it contains a threat. Wherein was written, it's reported among the heathen, the Gentiles, and Gashmu saith it. And old Gashmu is ever with us. He's the fellow that is the worst gossip of all. And I've discovered that sometimes the worst gossip is a man, not a woman. And here was old Gashmu saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words. And what an awful thing to circulate about this man. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There's a king in Judah. And now shall it be reported to the king according to these words, Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. See, he threatens Nehemiah. He said, Now this is the report we hear. Now we want to know whether it's true or not, because we're getting ready to pass this information on to the king. Well, my friend, why don't they wait until the gossip becomes fact, which it could never become? But why not determine whether it's factual or not before they pass the gossip on to the king? Not this crowd. They're not your friend, by the way. Now, and I sent unto them, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. You actually didn't hear them. You made these things up yourself. And this was a nice way that Nehemiah had of calling them liars. He said, you're a pack of liars. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hand. Nehemiah went to the Lord, and he said, Lord, they're doing this to weaken me and to hinder your work here. Strengthen my hands here. Now, he said, afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delah, the son of Mehitabil, who was shut up, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am 
would go into the temple to save his life. I'll not go in. These friends, on the other hand, so-called friends, they pretend to have a great interest in him. They don't want him to risk his life, but they want him to do a very cowardly thing. And this man, Nehemiah, had a real spiritual discernment. Verse 12, Lo, I perceive that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. I tell you that this man, Nehemiah, is in the thick of plots and schemes to destroy him. And he says here, Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so, and sin, and that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. And this man, Nehemiah now, after he's called them a liar, and he's dealt with this crowd that pretended to be his friends, and I tell you, He's in a difficult spot. He's in between a rock and a hard place. But he turns to God. And now we find in verse 15, the wall was finished in 52 days. Verse 15, so the wall was finished in the 20th and 5th day of the month, Elo, in 50 and 2 days. It came to pass that when all of our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Only God could have accomplished this through them. Moreover, in those days, now notice here, the trouble's not over even though it's finished. There's still danger. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many, now listen to this, for there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Aaron, his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. So all this time, there was this playing footsie with the enemies of God. And it ushered in, actually, old Geshem and Sanballat said, look to the nobles, we're your friends. That man Nehemiah, He's a hard bird to get along with, and we're trying to. And the sons and daughters met each other. They had little get-togethers. And as a result, why, there was intermarriage. And because of that, you see this fellow here, Tobiah, had a telephone right in to the walls of Jerusalem. And this wasn't good. And they reported his good deeds before me. So these kinfolk by marriage, they'd come to Nehemiah and says, Nehemiah, you're so hard on Tobiah. He's really a lovely gentleman. And they began to tell of uh, good deeds of his. And they uttered my words to him. In other words, they were acting as liaison officers, which means there were a bunch of tattletales. And everything Nehemiah would say and what went on, they went back and told Tobiah. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. And Tobiah says, I've heard what you're saying about me, and it's not true. Now that brings us here to the seventh chapter. Walls are finished now. And we're going to see next time, as we move not only into this chapter, but the next one, we're going to see one of the great revivals that took place in that day. After the walls were finished, you must remember that there are two prophets that are prophesying at this time, Haggai and Zechariah. And during this period, why the word of God will be brought out and read to the people. And as a result, revival will come. We believe that revival can only come today through the Word of God. And we believe that all these movements to get the Word of God out, and we're not alone in this. We're not trying to say that. We believe there are others, and there are many fine pastors trying to get the Word of God out. And we believe on this background, we could have revival in our day. Let's pray about it.
As we break from our weekday study in Nehemiah, why don't you join me for Dr. McGee's Sunday sermon called Nehemiah Will Lead Us in Prayer. You can listen online or see if your station carries the Sunday sermon at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you back here next time as we continue to make our way through the Bible. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.